Warning, the video you're about to watch contains mathematics at the level of integral calculus, also known as Calc 2. All material has an assumed prerequisite of differential calculus and a full semester course in trigonometry. A thorough review of prerequisite topics can be found by searching the web. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook over. Hello, my name is Roy Simpson, professor of mathematics at Cosumnes River College in Sacramento, California. This video is meant for Calc 2 students who are going through currently Power Series, specifically Taylor and McLaurin Series. Taylor and McLaurin Series are those series where you can actually find, um, or is a process to which you can actually find the Power Series for any given function or for most given functions. So you should already know that the Taylor series of a function is actually, let me go ahead and highlight this, the summation from zero to infinity of the ith derivative of your original function evaluated at the center divided by i factorial. By the way, you probably have seen this as n, n equals zero to infinity of the nth derivative of f at the center a divided by n factorial times the quantity x minus the center to the nth power. That's how you have seen it. However, uh, for this discussion today, I'm gonna to be talking error bounds. And so therefore I'm changing the index on this for a very specific reason, uh, mainly because in the index for our error bound, I'm using the letter N. So anyhow, um, that would, if it was going to infinity, be the uh, Taylor polynomial approximation or the Taylor series expansion uh, for a function f about its center a. Well, here's a big question. Is every function equal to its Taylor series expansion or its Taylor series about some center a? Is it true that every function is equal to its Taylor series? And the answer to that is no, it's definitely not true. Every function, pretty much, not everyone, but most functions have a Taylor series expansion, but to say that the function is actually equal to the Taylor series expansion is a bit of a reach, to be honest with you. So what we're gonna develop here in this video is a way that you can determine whether or not a function is actually equal to its Taylor series polynomial expansion. Let's talk about Taylor remainders first, because this is going to be important. And actually, the idea of the nth Taylor polynomial is going to be incredibly important if you go into anything uh, in um, maybe numerics or um, numerical analysis or uh, numerical mathematics, applied mathematics. So knowing what an nth degree Taylor polynomial is will be very important. What is the nth degree Taylor polynomial? Well, I'm glad I asked. It is the nth degree polynomial that you get when you try to expand the Taylor power series or the Taylor series for a function, but you only go out to the nth degree. Now, one thing that often gets confused by students and some instructors alike is that if I say I want the fifth degree, let's just pretend Taylor series expansion or a Taylor polynomial for a given function, a lot of people think that it needs to have five terms. First of all, it will never just have five terms. It could have six terms because remember, n starts at actually zero and then goes. So in this case, and let me make this a bit smaller just so that it makes it a little bit faster for us to talk about. If I wanted a third degree Taylor polynomial expansion, I would start at zero so I'd have the zeroth derivative evaluated at the center divided by zero factorial times x minus a to the zeroth, and we'll talk about all that in a second, plus the first derivative of our function evaluated at a over one factorial, x minus a to the first, and so on and so forth down the line. However, there's an issue with saying that this Taylor polynomial is equal to the Taylor series expansion for our function f. It's not equal because we're missing a lot of terms, right? This only goes out to the third degree. In other words, if you were to multiply everything out, you'd have a third degree polynomial. 
And no, please do not assume that I just distributed that three. I'm just showcasing that when you multiply out this binomial times itself three times, you'll get an X cubed. So you will get a third degree polynomial from this expansion. Now, a few things I do want to mention before we go too far. The zeroth derivative. What does that mean? Well, the zeroth derivative is just the original function. So that is just F evaluated at A. Also, zero factorial is not zero. Zero factorial is defined to be one. So just be aware of that. Um, and then the other thing I want to warn you of, because this often gets confused, I see even instructors do this, where they say, oh, the third degree Taylor polynomial. And what they'll do with every single function that they encounter is they'll uh, sum it up until they get the three terms. So they'll, or four terms technically, they'll get this one, this one, this one, and this one. The problem is that sometimes you have a, uh, for example, actually, here's a perfect example. Since you're going through Taylor series right now, you happen to know the following, that the cosine might be, I'm not going to say it's equal to, it's power series, but I'm going to say it might be equal to the summation n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the nth times x to the 2n plus one over 2n plus one. Whoops, x to the 2n. Actually, let's do sine because I think that'll be more beneficial. Let's do the sign over 2n plus 1 factorial. There we go. That's the sign. So <clears throat> now if I wanted the third degree Taylor polynomial expansion, this definition is actually somewhat broken for that. If you pay attention to this expansion, it is not going to, if we went to three, if I sum this from i equals zero to three, there would be a problem and I'll show you why. Well, if you were to split this out, if you plug in i equals zero, you get negative one to the zero, which obviously is just one, times x to the zero plus one over zero plus one factorial, or in other words, just one. And then minus, because the alternating factor there. Now when you plug in i equals one, you get a negative one to the first, okay? And then you get x to the two plus one or x cubed upstairs over three factorial. Minus, if you kept going, you would go beyond a third degree Taylor polynomial. So here's the deal. Use this definition a little loosely here. Really, you want to sum from zero up to enough of a power so that you get a third degree polynomial in the end. For example, sine, because its power on x is not just n, it is 2n plus 1, you're skipping over power. So you don't want to add up the first four terms of this. If you did that, you would get this business right here. And that is definitely not a third degree polynomial. So when you see t sub 3, you should just think, I'm going to sum up to some number here. And I just sum up enough terms to where I get a third degree polynomial and then you stop. So do not think that you need to have three plus one or four terms in your expansion. Do not think that you need to go to the number three either. Just go until you get a third degree polynomial. Very, very important. It's a hard definition to really encapsulate in language. But the reality is, if you just remember it as this is supposed to be an nth degree polynomial. Uh, so if n is three, you need a third degree polynomial. Well, if that's the case, then I will stop when I reach the third degree. All right, so that's just something that I've noticed. Uh, some people go carry this out too far. Uh, and so I just wanna be very clear about that. On to the next page here. You can see that I say, well, that definition should make sense. Well, who knows if it makes sense to you or not. Hopefully it does. But now we're going to introduce something called the Taylor remainder. It is the error that you that you have in your, let's say, third degree Taylor polynomial approximation. It's how far off you are from the actual polynomial approximation to your uh, function. So for example, in our case, when we're dealing with the sine of X, the 
Taylor remainder, the third degree Taylor remainder is going to be the sine of X minus that third degree Taylor polynomial we had. And so that will be the sine of X minus X plus X cubed over three factorial. Now, the problem with the Taylor remainder is that you need to know your actual original function. And very often you either don't or it's just a terrible, this would be a terrible computation to make. So this is kind of uh, more of a theoretical um, error, but still we're gonna need it for some discussions in a few moments. So that is our definition of the Taylor remainder. It's the difference between the actual function and the polynomial approximation that you're using. And down here you can see that is, our function is made up of a third degree polynomial. Let's just, I'm, I'm picking on three here. So our function is made up of a third degree polynomial plus the remainder, basically all the extra bits that we didn't add in there. If you think about our sine of X minus T sub three of X, well, remember sine of X is supposed to be X minus X cubed over three factorial that's supposed to be a factorial, plus uh, x to the fifth over five factorial minus x to the seventh over seven factorial and so on and so forth down the line. Well, if I take the sine function, which is what this is, and if I subtract off the first two terms of that, basically the third degree polynomial part of that, then I'm left with all the stuff that I didn't add up. All right, so going back to the function is equal to the nth degree Taylor polynomial expansion plus the remainder, that would basically say that sine of X is equal to the third degree Taylor polynomial expansion, which is just X minus X cubed over three factorial, plus, I'll use a different ink for this, the rest of it. That's really what this means is the rest. It means remainder, but I'm saying it's the rest of it. So plus, uh, X to the fifth over five factorial and so on and so forth. And what we're gonna do here is we want to showcase or we wanna figure out how is a Taylor series equal to its function or in other words, how is a function equal to its Taylor series polynomial expansion? Well, for those two things to be equal, we want the function to actually become its Taylor series polynomial expansion as N tends to infinity. That is, we want this remainder to disappear as time goes on. So that's what that last sentence is. However, for the function to equal the limit of this sum, we would require the remainder tends to zero as n goes to infinity. And this naturally leads to the next theorem. How do we guarantee that our Taylor polynomial expansion is actually equal to our function. And then, as I mentioned before, that is just a requirement, or the requirement is that our remainder here tends to zero as n goes to infinity. So if our function is equal to our nth Taylor polynomial expansion plus the nth Taylor remainder, which is pretty much the, if you let t equal three, it'd be uh, the Taylor polynomial up to the third degree. And then the remainder is just everything left over after uh, that third degree. So it'd be the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh degree terms and so on and so forth. If that remainder tends to zero for all X that gets really close to the center, how close within some amount R, we'll call that capital R there. So that visually means that you have a center at A and then you are allowed to take, you're considering all values from X minus R, sorry, A minus R to A plus R. You're considering all X values in that interval. And you're saying, well, if the nth Taylor remainder is tending to zero for all X values in that radius around the center, then and only then can we say our function is actually equal 
to our Taylor series expansion about the center A, because the remainder will disappear as N goes to infinity. As you add more terms, that remainder tends to zero, it tends to disappear as time goes on. Again, R in this case is the radius of convergence for our series. So that is that tricky little R that we're talking about right here. Now, as I mentioned in this paragraph below, the hardest part is showing that the Taylor remainder tends to zero. Because remember, with our sine formula, we had the third degree Taylor remainder be all the stuff after the third degree. So it was x to the fifth over five factorial minus x to the seventh over seven factorial and so on and so forth. And to showcase that that tends to zero as n goes to infinity, in other words, as we increase this number, so we go to r sub 100 and then r sub 1000 and then r sub, you know, whatever, right? We wanna showcase that this will tend to zero. When I say this, I really mean starting at uh, the next degree in lines. But we want to showcase that that polynomial, when you plug in any x value in the radius of convergence, will tend to zero as time goes on. And that's actually incredibly challenging to do. So instead, we're going to use something called Taylor's inequality. Now, Taylor's inequality is something that you're normally not going to prove uh, thoroughly in a entry level calculus course. You do this in maybe numerical analysis um, or even analysis in upper division mathematics. But for now, we're just gonna state it here. If your n plus first derivative is bounded by some number, in other words, at max, we know that the n plus first derivative is bounded by 10, for example, on some interval, that's where this absolute value comes into play. Very often in Calc 2 is uh, people get very frustrated with that, but it's really just saying I have an interval from A minus D to A plus D. And in this case, they're actually including the edges of the interval because it's less than or equal to. So again, if our N plus first derivative is less than some magic number on this interval, which is centered at A, then the remainder, the nth degree Taylor remainder is bounded above by that value of M divided by N plus one factorial times X minus A in absolute value to the N plus first power. I actually don't write it like that normally. I write it this way. I write X minus A in absolute value to the N plus first power over N plus one factorial. I don't know why I write it that way. I think it just to my brain looks a little nicer. And as I note, there is a proof, at least in the textbook that I use, there's a proof of this for N equals one, but higher values of N are not considered. So because it's only for N equals one, I'm not even gonna bother proving it. It's just not worth my time. So let's go ahead and use that theory here. Now, your instructor should have already shown that the Taylor series centered at zero for f of x equals e to the x is this power series right here. And that was probably developed using the actual definition of a Taylor or Maclaurin series. By the way, I will say Taylor series centered at zero. Other people will say Maclaurin series, which means Taylor series centered at zero. It's just most of us in mathematics call them Taylor series. And then we tell you the center. Anyhow. But now we're gonna prove that e to the x is actually equal to its Taylor series centered at zero. So let's go ahead and go about that. I first note that the interval of convergence for this power series is infinity. And that's something that we've proved, at least in my class, we've already proved that. You could totally prove that using the ratio test. If you wanna do that, go ahead and do it, have fun with that. So we know that this converges for all values of x. Now, what we want to do is show that the limit as n goes to infinity of the Taylor remainder tends to zero. And that's where r sub n, the Taylor remainder, is just a difference between the function we're working with, which is e to the x, and its nth degree Taylor polynomial expansion. And you can see why an index of i is really confounding because you have this i factorial down there, which looks like an i and a reciprocal of i if you will. All right, 
So we want to go ahead and work with that nth degree Taylor remainder. By Taylor's inequality theorem, what we really want to do is we want to take a look at the n plus first derivative of our function. So if f of x is equal to e to the x, well then the n plus first derivative, this is why e to the x is kind of the nicest one to work with, the n plus first derivative is actually just e to the x. And by Taylor's inequality, we want to look at the absolute value of the n plus first derivative and we want to find an upper bound. We want to find that upper bound there. And by the way, we want to find that upper bound on the interval a minus d to a plus d. Now, when we built this power series for e to the x, when we built the Taylor series here, this was centered at zero. So the value of a that we're dealing with is actually zero. So if I scroll back down here, I want to find a maximum value for our n plus first derivative on the interval negative d to d. And because our n plus first derivative is actually just e to the x, and we know that e to the x is an increasing function, the maximum value or an upper bound for e to the x is actually e to the d power. Now that's not the only maximum, it's just a maximum. You could obviously take a number larger than that, than that if you want to, but I'm gonna go ahead and say that e to the x, the magnitude of it, is less than e to the d, less than or equal to e to the d, when the absolute value of x is less than or equal to d. Now remember, the nth remainder is less than or equal to m times the absolute value of x minus the center, which is zero, raise the n plus one over n plus one factorial. However, we have just shown that m can be set to be e to the d. So this is gonna be e to the d, where d is just a constant, so e to the d is also a constant. Uh, let's see, absolute value of x to the n plus first, all over n plus one factorial. Now, everything we're talking about here is about the interval from negative d to positive d, where d is just some constant somebody will come in the room with later, all right? So let's go ahead and highlight that interval. d could be, by the way, a billion. So our interval can be absolutely massive. Remember, the interval of convergence of this power series is negative infinity to positive infinity. So I need my argument to rely upon an arbitrary value of D that somebody can come in the room with and say, oh, I bet you can't make this work for D equals 10 trillion. I could say, well, I sure can make it work for D equals 10 trillion. So no matter what, E to the X is still less than or equal to E to the 10 trillion power. But that creates a massive upper bound there, but that's still okay. Now what we want is we want this remainder to tend to zero. Well, if you take a look at this remainder, it's the absolute value that's greater than zero, and it's bounded above by e to the d x to the n plus one over n plus one factorial. That is, we have this triple-sided inequality right here. Now, before I continue with this argument, I need you to understand something that's very, very critical. It's also kind of obscure. People have a hard time with this. So note, we happen to know that this converges, this power series right here, converges for all infinity. I, this is so important, I'm gonna write it off to the side. So our power series there converges for all x in the real numbers. Well, what does that mean? If a series converges, that means its terms, the limit as n goes to infinity of its terms must be zero. It's an incredibly obscure use of that theorem, but when you first started talking about infinite series, one of the theorems you talked about was the fact that if your series converges, then the terms or the sequence that the series is based upon must tend to zero as n goes to infinity. Thus, the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n over n factorial must be zero. Another way you could write that, by the way, is you could say the limit as n goes to infinity of x to the n plus one over n plus one factorial must go to zero. 
That's just because I'm only adding one to those powers, so who cares if you add one more to the powers? Or you could just do a substitution if you want to and let, say, instead of n, call n n plus one. Well then, as n plus one goes to infinity, x to the n plus one over n plus one factorial must be zero because this series right here converges. Well, because that limit converges to zero, I could take the limit as n goes to infinity of all three sides of this inequality. And on the first one, obviously, the limit as n goes to infinity of zero is zero. On the right hand side, the limit as n goes to infinity of e to the d times the absolute value of x to the n plus one over n plus one factorial. That's the same thing as e to the d times the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of x. Now the absolute value of x technically is not x, so I could see how somebody might say, wait a second, this is a completely different function. But remember that our power series converges for any x. Specifically, it will converge for positive values of x. So if I force positivity on my x's, I still will have convergence for my original power series. Thus, this limit will tend to zero. By the squeeze theorem, since the limit of the right-hand side as n goes to infinity is zero, the limit of the left-hand side of this inequality as n goes to infinity is zero. That implies the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of our nth Taylor remainder must also be zero. And remember, if a limit of the absolute value of a sequence is zero, then the limit of the actual sequence itself must therefore also be zero. And so we have proven that our remainder tends to zero as n goes to infinity. And because we have proven that, we have by this theorem right here, if the limit of the remainder tends to zero, then the function is equal to its Taylor series expansion. Thus, e to the x is actually equal to the summation from zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. That's how you would use Taylor's inequality to showcase that a function's actually equal to its power or Taylor series expansion. Now, let me allay any concerns that I may get from my students. My students will ask, wait a second, is this something that we have to do? Is this something that's gonna appear on an exam? And the answer to that is actually no. I would not do this because this is more of a numerical analysis type uh, concept. And uh, it, is, it suffices to say that for the vast majority of functions that you're handed, they are actually equal to their Taylor series. If they're not, it's mainly because they're really terrible functions. Things like that involve absolute values or um, functions that are non-elementary. So you, uh, there are some functions, but you're not gonna deal with them a lot that are not equal to their Taylor series expansions. And uh, if you have to deal with those, um, then you're likely in a higher level numerical analysis course and you have to uh, check the remainders at that point. But at least in Calc 2, you don't really have to check the remainders. And that's why I made a video out of this because I didn't wanna talk about this in class. If you're one of my students, you may assume that the functions you're dealing with do equal their Taylor series polynomial expansions. All right, that's it for this video. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. See you next time. It's the system of equations. We must deal with them all at once. Always looking for solutions. Positive outlook overcomes. Obstacles getting in our way comes. Effects more than we can sometimes see. Things for what they are and work together until you feel at peace. Listen close. Too much that isn't kosher You may really hurt inside It doesn't justify you to speak too loud and cry